let's talk about the National Osteoporosis Foundation. Funny we should talk about that. Yeah. And uh, what are their guidelines? What do they recommend about uh, uh, nationality, comorbidities? What are your goals? So um, we don't actually put out specific guidelines. What we have is a clinician's guide. And the clinician's guide is to provide clinical guidance where there may not be the guidelines that we need. So, um, but Dr. Singer can talk to you more about what the actual guidelines say. And there's, um, they're available on our website. They're being updated right now. It's free, we have an app, et cetera. So it makes it easy for clinicians in a certain situation to come to the United Osteoporosis Foundation and find out what they need. Do you remember your website? I do, it's nof.org. N-O-F as in N -O foundation. N-O-F as in foundation. O-R-G. That's it. So they can go there and they can yep. get all of this. And so what are you looking to do? Are you looking to prevent all osteoporosis or find all osteoporosis? That's different, isn't it? It is. I think we're really looking to get those at highest risk. And like I said, you know, Dr. Singh, you might want to take on what that, the guidelines actually sure. say. I, so I think there are two aspects. One is talking about secondary prevention, right? That's looking at the group who's already had that first fracture. And in some ways, we could think about them as the low-hanging fruit. They've already declared themselves. They're kind of waving a flag at us saying, I've had a fracture notice me, that's a group that I, there's very little controversy that we should pay attention to and treat. The second issue is primary prevention, trying to cast a wider net and find patients who are at high risk and have not yet had that fracture. In an ideal world, we would be doing both. When we talk about constrained resources and all of those things, I think the goal is to sort of start with the highest risk group, particularly those who have fractured, and then work out beyond that. I want to ask something that I think comes out of left field. Nationality, are there some ethnicities that are at higher risk? Should we be triggering earlier on some folks than others? I heard a yes, yes. for yeah. example. Well, well I'll, I'll let the doctors give the examples, but go ahead. Little white women, um, you know, so if I have to sort <laughs> of point to myself, you know. Why are you pointing at yourself? Self, you know? <laughs> um, but if we look at sort of at least within the US, um, Caucasians, uh, Hispanics, African Americans, um, and, uh, and Asians. Caucasian women tend to be at highest risk. African Americans out of those four groups tend to be at lowest risk because they tend to reach higher peak bone densities and have more dense bones. And then Hispanics and Asians fall in between. So there are some ethnic differences. Family history and genetics are important. But that alone is not the sole driver. We have to look at it in the context. You don't, you don't ignore some, some groups just because they're of a, a particular right. ethnicity. Osteoporosis does not spare any race and it does not spare either gender. Now, there are guidelines, right? There are clinical guidelines for physicians. Um, do docs follow them? Uh, most docs uh, don't that, like guidelines. Are they aware there are guidelines? Uh, yeah, um, <laughs> I'm gonna talk, so I'm gonna talk about what I've seen at our institution. I'm proud of our institution because uh, in no way do I think primary care physicians don't understand this. Their challenge is their practice uh, landscape and the time and just the pressures of being a busy primary care physician. So if we talk about use of DEXA and doing the right thing after the DEXA report is reported, uh, our primary care physicians in two analyses, three out of four times, they get a DEXA, patient falls into a high risk group, they place, the pa they place the patient on the therapy. What happens is bisphosphonates are not easy to take, uh, and in anyone's hands, they're not, at one or two years, they're not always being uh, continued to take. Um, I think where uh, guidelines are challenging for primary care physicians would be, okay, this general sense that a patient at risk needs to be treated for three to five years. Well, what happens after that if there are other risks. And I think that's where uh, subspecialty care and patients uh, and practices really devoted to high risk patients you know, can help. But I, th I think- But are there enough subspecialists? No, and, and let me make a couple of comments as a primary care physician. So I'm still in the trenches primary care doc, although I obviously do a lot of bone, so I sort of think of myself as a PCP bonehead. <laughs> I, only I can call myself that, you cannot. Um, at Captain least to Kirk my called face. his doctor bones. How's <laughs> That's that? That's true. Um, so I think as Tom mentioned, part of the issue is competing priorities. Right? A patient comes in to see their primary care doc with seven problems on their list for the day, or they have diabetes, heart disease, hypertension. Osteoporosis falls down here somewhere. 
we need to say, you know, I can't get to everything today, but I'm going to bring you back in to talk about this. It's also not that docs in general and primary care providers don't want to do the right thing, they do, but other things get in the way. There are also multiple sets of guidelines that are out there issued by different societies and they don't all make the same recommendations. So it becomes a little bit of this decision paralysis. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have too many um, recommendations coming at you and the experts can't agree, I don't know what to do. So the path of least resistance is to do nothing. You know what I hear? I hear from primary cares. I got a stack, if I were to stack them on my desk, now it's in my computer, this high. I've got the urology guidelines, I've got the heart guidelines, the lung guidelines. I've got guidelines about which guidelines are the right guidelines. And sitting in there is your guideline. Which of these do I have to follow? And if I follow all of them, I'll see one patient a day. Yeah, I, I think what you, what, what you have to do, what all of us have to do in our institution, in our community, is try to understand how we can make it a little bit easier. Um, we try to do that and by interpreting DEXA to the way we were told by our primary care physicians they wanted it. And one of the major reasons that I would say a relatively straightforward osteoporosis referral comes to us is really because, uh, as Dr. Singer said, competing, pro you know, just time, and they just don't have enough time to, to explain, uh, not that they don't know what to do, and we can just focus on that one issue uh, and have the time to, to do that. 